This is a cantilever gate, and today on SWI, we're gonna show you how we built this 46-foot massive cantilever gate for a 30-foot opening. What makes a cantilever gate a cantilever gate is that it is suspended completely over the ground. It has no wheels rolling across the ground or touching the ground in any way, shape, or form. And that's important in our area because we get a lot of snow, and so wheels on the ground aren't the best way. We wanna suspend everything. Now, the drawbacks to cantilever gates, we are gonna have a gap down here below the gate. A lot of people don't understand that, but we have to have enough room for the wheels, which means that this gate will ride anywhere from six to eight inches off the ground. A lot of fence contractors have difficulty building Building these specifically for two reasons. One, a lot of gates don't get installed with this, which is what we call a compression arch or a bow brace. And that keeps this gate, because it is so long, from doing this stuff in the wind. What we want it to do is be nice and straight and always hit the latch post. And in Wyoming's wind, if we don't put these on there, that gate will flap all over the place and potentially miss the latch when we put an operator on it or if the customer ever wants to put an operator on it. And then they have a really tough time making these nice saddles right down here because we're trying to saddle a piece of inch and seven eighths with two and three eighths. And then also on this side, it's saddled with inch and seven eighths. But we've got a machine inside that will show you that makes all this very, very easy for our company because we've invested in the tools. And it could make it easy for your company too if you're looking to build cantilever gates in your shop and not wait forever and ever, ever on long lead times. Important things to note are that we cannot have any chain link touching these pipes because we need to have our rollers and our rollers will come down to about here. So we need to keep all this chain link short of that to make sure that it doesn't interfere with our rollers, which is why our company uses this tension wire just to give it some more rigidity because there's nothing that we can tie this top and bottom to. So we hog ring the tension wire. One of the other things you'll notice about the gates that we build is we always put our diagonals the same way down the entire length of the gate. I'm gonna guess somewhere in this area is about where the gate opening will stop. A lot of people put diagonals this way here and then on the front part of the gate, they'll put them all this way. The reason we don't do that is because we create a weak point right here wherever we change those diagonals. It's really strong at the bottom, but very weak at the top because we don't have anything supporting it. So we were taught by the great Fred Vanette never ever to change the way your diagonals go. That's what we were taught. If there's an engineer watching this and they wanna chime in on whether or not this is or is not correct, I'd love your feedback, but this is the way we were taught. It makes sense to me. We've never had a gate break or fail, so it's worked for us. Now, the other thing there's a huge discussion on is whether or not these diagonals should go top to bottom or if they should be the other way. Because this is a rigid item and it's welded solid, we don't put a lot of weight into changing the direction because it's got a rigid piece rather than a flexible truss rod. So this gate is actually designed to slide to the left. So we've got our diagonals and compression. Now, if they were in tension, which would be the opposite way, I still wouldn't worry about it a lot because that's a solid welded object. And again, we've had no failures if we've ever had to flip these upside down. Now, let's say we get to the job site and now the customer has decided that they want to slide the gate the other way. Well, we just simply slide it the other way. We don't do anything different. The fabric stays on the same side of the gate and the diagonals are now just in tension instead of compression. The engineers are welcome to chime in and tell me how wrong that is or whether or not it matters because uh, I'm genuinely curious. And that is also why we put fabric over the entire gate, not only for automation purposes, but if we ever had to change the handing, it could be a real lifesaver and time saver if you get to the job site and for some reason you need to change the way the gate slides like I say this one's gonna slide left but if we had to slide it right no big deal we just slide it right and now all of a sudden our bracing is in tension instead of compression so it's that easy and that's why we do that it also adds a little bit of safety when we have automated gates because as you well know we have to have very small spaces I think it's a two and a quarter inch sphere can't pass through this gate so that just gives us that little bit of extra protection for automated gates in that case as well covering the entire slide area so that's why we do that but I think right now what you'd like to see is how we build these dang things. You're probably wondering how this all starts. And this starts with this guy right here. This is Nicholas. And what he does initially is we have to create a drawing so that we know exactly where everything's gonna go. So he makes these nice drawings on some... Uh, what are you using? DraftSite. Draft so DraftSite is a SolidWorks program. And anybody in the fabrication space knows that SolidWorks is like the name. So we have to get it from this drawing here, and then he takes this drawing, but we need to do a lot of special fabrication for all these joints. And that's where he creates this drawing right here that goes down to our dragon. Ben Tech Dragon. Which will plasma cut all those special copes on the end of those pipes so that they fit snugly with zero gap. 
When you don't have that tool, what you get is a lot of really, really sloppy joints, filler welds, and some people will smash things to try and eliminate having to have a coped joint. We see just about everything, but with our machinery, we don't have to do any of that, so we can get that nice fabricated joint that should be there and it looks nice without any trouble whatsoever. The first step is taking this drawing and putting it into something that the computer downstairs can then read and cut. So after I get the overall height and length, I can plug those values in here and it draws out the lines for me. After that, I go and make even spacing and add pipe widths. And that gives me where my center mark is. You've got your center mark on the end post. And then I go over, find the center mark on the next post in. And that gives me all of my picking nodes for doing it in the Dragon software. We try and stay under five feet for our bays. Each individual vertical needs to be less than five feet. And that's just because we're adding a lot of gate and we don't want any bowing and deflection in between those verticals where we don't have a vertical as that gate rolls. We want it to roll smooth. And if we have a really heavy gate and really wide bays, it can add problems to us where we get bowing and then the gate kind of humps and bumps all the way through there. And one of the other things we try and do is we try and keep that angle less than 45 degrees. Now, some engineers said that doesn't matter, but again, because we do want to keep that bending moment on that pipe down we do space that less than five feet just because of the weight okay now we're gonna go downstairs and show you what the dragon does so this is the tool that allows us to do all these cool things this is how we get all those perfect copes every time regardless of what pipe size we're trying to match up so as you can see this isn't even if we were trying to cope this piece of pipe to the same size it should be even on both sides but on one side we're trying to cope to an inch and seven eighths and on the other side we're trying to cope to two and three eighths so that's why it looks weird so once we've programmed all that stuff in, we get all these perfect parts, then we can begin our assembly. And handily enough, it will actually scribe or mark the parts based on the input that Nicholas has given it with the etching or scribing tool that we have right here. So we have done some pre-setup to make this thing go smoothly. So we've pre-cut our horizontals and coped them on both ends using the tool in the other shop. Now we buy our pipe in 40 foot joints. So unless the gate is longer, like the one we showed you outside, we don't have to splice any pipe. If you do splice pipe, it is very imperative that you make sure that it's all joined up well. And the other thing that's really important that people forget is, is that you need to have a gap in between your pipes so you can get full penetration because on the surface, we're going to grind all that weld down. So it has to get full penetration all the way through the pipe. And people that just do a surface weld, but their pipe up tight together, don't get good penetration, that's when the gates break. Other things to note is we are using a vertical here that we've got pre-cut. Another place that we've seen people have issues with cantilever gates is not cutting all their verticals exactly the same length, which is one of the reasons that it's really nice to have the dragon. The dragon will make sure that every part is extremely consistent. So we're using these verticals here. We've got them strapped so that the gate's tight and then we'll weld on our actual verticals to the end. A lot of people will weld their vertical in between right here, but we will go ahead and weld a two and three eighths pipe extending past which serves two purposes number one it gives us a stop for the cantilever gate rollers and number two that we're using a two and three eighths pipe so that as we pull that tension on that fabric we're not risking bowing the the pipe at all taylor can you tell us what's really important when we get ready to set this thing up uh so the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure this is perfectly straight as an arrow because you'll have a crappy looking cantilever gate if not how do you know that well, let's just say i've had some experience oh. with crappy cantilever gates after that, we put the posts in at each end and tack them, and then we'll pull measurements from each corner to get it square. Our goal is always to make a nice straight gate, which is why we start out this way, because once we tack this gate up, if there's a crook in it, it will stay in it forever. We'll check these things with the string and our eye, make sure this thing's nice and straight, and then we'll start tacking this stuff up. Should we do it? Let's, let's do it. Let's do let's it. Do it. Now would be a great time to tell you that we offer these kits shipped directly to your door so that you don't have to do any of that stuff and you can weld it up at your shop or your house should you want to build one of these. The coping is definitely the most difficult part. And so if you want us to handle that for you, there's a link down below where you can have us design your gate and ship it straight to your doorstep. And you can have a successful cantilever gate and not wait the long lead times that it may take to get one from a local manufacturer. It will include is everything that you need. Diagonals, verticals. The thing you won't get is the long horizontal pieces of pipe. Prior to us even completing your order, you'll get a drawing so that we make sure that we we fabricate the right gate for your particular application. If you're interested in that, there's a link down below where you can purchase and build it on your own at your place, thereby eliminating the hassle of trying to ship a 40 some foot or 20 or 30 foot gate. Boom, we got you. Not to mention, you know that it'll be done right.
You may be wondering what the reveal is. This gate does not have any barbed wire, so this has a half inch reveal down here and a four inch reveal up there, which will act as our stop so that it can come out of the rollers. Now, if you did have barbed wire, we've got two different ways we can do the barbed wire. We leave them extended and then we run the barbed wire up about yay high and then we do it every four inches. The other option is to have barbed wire arms that are standoff, they come out, go up, so that you can run over the rollers and we can do that that way if you want. We just find this way to be fairly handy. I'm gonna show you something you may not have known. Let's go this way. So this is low carbon barbed wire. This is standard low carbon four point barbed wire, which is used on just about every chain link fence you've ever seen. Sometimes people use high tensile. If you're going to use high tensile, this trick probably will not work. But I'm going to show you how to take something that looks like this. When it looks like this, it wants to wrap all the way back up and come into a big old wadded up coil. Well, there's a way that we can make that wire a lot easier to work with and a lot easier to stretch so that we don't have saggy barbed wire on short runs. Just like that. Now instead of having a coiled up piece of barbed wire, I have a nice straight piece of barbed wire that's a lot easier to get straight and nice and looking good on our gates or our very short runs. All we did was add some more twist to it and that makes it nice and straight. It does not weaken it, but makes it a lot easier to stretch out. So for those of you that don't know what they're doing, they're taking the diagonal because the diagonal is how we can tell if this is square. Because if everything else is being the same, it's well been the same, it's the same dimension. If we take a diagonal from this, yeah. both directions, from that direction and from this direction, they should equal. And if they don't, we just move the gate until it does equal, that makes sure we're square. Very important, and a lot of people don't know that. So be There's a better way to do this. We just haven't implemented it because we don't have enough shop space. But the best way to do this is number one, we can build some short saw horses that are about eight feet wide. The better way to do this is if you remember Victor's video right over here, when he welded his gate, he had a sliding track system. We could have an expandable system with support all the way down. We simply don't have the shop space yet to have that unobstructed. We need to be able to use this space for multiple different things, roll in forklifts and things like that. So that's why we haven't done that yet. But if you have the shop space, making an expandable system where you can put some saw horses on the track is absolutely the best way to go. I supervise so much that they built me my special chair for just such an occasion. This is just another example of the handiness of Nicholas and Taylor. They're known around here as the dream team because if you can dream it up, they'll build it. Like literally, they will absolutely make sure it happens. And in record time usually. So we're using this string just to get a visual representation to make sure that the gate's super straight. Now if we just make sure this thing's not touching anywhere and runs right down, that's well, pretty good right there, huh? But as long as we put all the webbing in and it's still straight and it still matches the string, we can tack it up and we're good to go. Oof. We're definitely still gonna need the straps. So what we're doing right now is we're marking the center line for where the verticals go in the webbing. This isn't a perfect mark, so we're just using our soapstone, but it gets us really close. After that, we'll go and put all of the webbing in and then square it up and straighten it up as it's needed. <laughs> Chef's kiss. So here I am clicking the wrong button. Here we are going to double check and make sure that we have our starting bar and our ending bar correct. They're different because they don't cope to inch and seven eighths and two and three eighths, they'll cope to two and three eighths and two and three eighths on one side, and then inch and seven eighths and two and three eighths on the other side. Those two have to be in the right spot. The rest of them are interchangeable. Which way are we going? Down this way? Move, move the top, of, yep, there you go. Now that we're all tacked in and together, I'm gonna to start at this end and I'm gonna work that way, welding out the top. Taylor's gonna to start at that end and come this way, welding out the top. And the reason we crisscross like that is because as you weld and put heat into the pipe, it wants to bow. 
But if we isolate this weld over here from his weld over there, they keep opposite tension in each other and it prevents it from bowing because by the time he gets here to put heat on that side, this side's cooled off. We uh, went ahead and finished welding. We did both sides. Then we hit it with the Gal Pro after hitting it with the wire wheel. That gets it nice and clean and helps prevent any kind of rusting. Now we're getting ready to fabric it and we have to start with tension wire. So we're gonna twist up this end, then we'll go over there and tighten that end. Then we finish out by tightening this bolt. That gets it nice and tight and that keeps the top and bottom of the fabric from being able to move when the gate moves. Oh, and you've, because you pay attention, you probably want to know why we used a brace band on that end and an eye bolt on this end. The reason is, see where this brace band is? There's not really a lot of room here for an eye bolt with that diagonal in there. If we put an eye bolt on one end and a brace band on the other, that just gives us some ability to get additional tension on that tension wire so that we can have nice tight wire at the top and bottom of our chain link. Could we use a brace band at both ends? Absolutely. All he did there after he cut that off was dimple it so that this nut can't come off easily. I do. Now what are we cut on? Now you're cut. Yeah. Work. The way that you want to be able to test this, to test whether or not it's tight enough, is kind of grab it here in the middle and if you can get just a little bit out of it, it's probably tight enough. As you can see down here, if you look down this, it's kind of wavy. We want to basically make this nice and straight when it's all said and done. It's called dressing it out. And if we get it too tight, we won't be able to dress that out. Good and snug, but not over tight. And I'll cut this. I'll go ahead and... And just like that, we're almost done with the cantilever gate. So that's basically how you build a cantilever gate. If you want a cantilever gate kit, check our link down below. You can buy the entire kit with the exception of the horizontals, but we can ship you everything else so that you can build this in your shop and easily fabricate it with dimensions and a drawing if you need to show your customers so that they can approve it. They're just gonna finish tying this up right now, basically wrapping up this gate. And the other thing you're probably wondering is, is we didn't put a sway brace on this. And the reason is, is that this gate isn't long enough to necessitate the sway brace. Usually anytime we go over about 25 feet, that's when we start adding sway braces. But this gate is under 25 feet for the opening. The gate is actually much longer than that. But this is for a 24 foot opening and it's a temporary gate. So that's why this gate is not getting one, but the one we showed you earlier is. As always, I'm Mark with SWI in Wyoming. We are the nation's fence company. And I hope you have a good dang day. What say you?